Thanks for joining us this week, and welcome to Mutuality Matters, a podcast hosted by CBE International, where our mission is to promote the biblical message that God calls women and men of all cultures, races, and classes to share authority equally in service and leadership in the home, church, and world. Let's get into this week's episode. Welcome to this week's episode of Intersectionality. We are your hosts, Dr. Angela Raven Anderson and Reverend Liz Testa. In this segment, we explore how our understanding of God and who God is calling us to be is informed at the intersection of race, gender, and religion. We examine how the combination of liberation, womanist, and egalitarian theologies represent an understanding of God's kingdom that embraces, restores, uplifts, and transforms all who enter therein. When we consider and learn from the wisdom gained in the lived experiences of women of color, our view of God's kingdom is stretched, contextualized, enriched, and expanded. So let's listen to their voices as they move us beyond the stained glass ceiling. Hey, Liz. Hey there, Angela, Dr. Angela. How are you today? (laughs) I was listening to some of your podcasts previously, and I noticed that the guests were often and usually referred to with their titles. So since I have the delight today of sitting in the primary host seat and interviewing (laughs) you, I, uh, I think I naturally deferred to the Dr. Angela. So that's where that came from. Okay. We can go with it today. (laughs) Okay. Very good. Very good. I am so delighted to be here. This is my second time on the podcast with you. And I am excited to be here uh, for our second podcast together, exploring intersectionality. Thought would be a fun thing to do, especially as the new year is upon us to just have some conversation together about you and how this podcast came into being and what draws you so much to this work of intersectionality, both for yourself personally and in life and ministry and all those good things. So without further ado, Dr. Angela. Feels weird in the hot seat. I'm just going to say it. (laughs) I I was so blessed to be invited to co-host with you because for four seasons, I had my own podcast, Lavish Hope stories of resilience and overcoming. And yes, it's good to be in the hosting seat. And it's also good to be able to share your wisdom and your insights with the body of Christ. Amen. You've got a lot of wisdom to share. First things first, let's just take a quick moment to share for our listeners. I developed some of these questions and topics that we're going to be ruminating on together today and that you're going to be sharing about thinking about what for myself, I would love to know about you and this podcast and this work of intersectionality and just thinking about what would our listeners to engage in. So I'm hopeful that this indeed will be something that bless many. So thank you for being uh, game for it, Dr. Angela. (laughs) So the first thing I'm curious about is how did you first hear about CBE, CBE International, Christians for Biblical Equality International? That's the parent organization of this podcast. And how did you get involved? Initially, Liz learned about CBE as I was doing an internship as part of my Master's of Divinity program. I was doing an internship at a local congregation here in Houston, and it was the site for the CBE conference that year. And as part of the internship, then I was helping to organize that conference. And that's how I really became uh, familiar with the organization the leadership, Mimi Haddad as the president, understanding the purpose of the organization to bring this light on the issues of mutuality, uh, in mutuality in Christ. And what does that mean for women who are called, for all of us actually who are called and understanding how that call comes about and what the scriptures say about who is called. And it was a very, it certainly helped me at that time because although I had gone, I was in seminary, I'll, I'll never forget my first kind of interview before starting seminary and being asked, so where do you think God is leading you in ministry? 
And having always been a servant at church, always involved in every single thing, parents who were leaders in the church, all I could say at that time was that I was, I know that God was calling me to serve and lead in ministry. I was yeah. truly afraid to say the words God is calling me to preach because it was not something that was affirmed or even to have official roles of leadership in my church tradition as I was growing up. So it was a very interesting journey for me going through seminary and then having this internship at a church that which was part of my tradition, but very non-traditional. And that was open to women in leadership. And so that was my foray into CBE. Uh, and then I began to just soak up so many of the resources that they had that really taught on egalitarian theology and really understanding that how God calls both men and women to serve based on gifting, not gender, but based on gifting. So very excited about that. And it's one of those things where you feel like, oh, I found my people. And just thinking about that journey, there's so many of us that, whether for ourselves personally or for perhaps women that we serve alongside of, mm -hmm. that we have seen how God reveals in due time, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, spaces and places where we can fully live into our callings and our gifts yes. and be able to claim them. So that's so beautiful yes. to hear your journey to that and praise God for that. <laughs> yeah. It was um, an important step for me because yeah. part of my beliefs was that I refused to walk into something believing that it's just the flavor of the month. I, I needed to have a biblical foundation mm -hmm. for knowing that I was going to be the places that I believed that God was calling me to stand. And I, I really, uh, I couldn't move with confidence if I didn't understand that. And that is what CBE is all about, right? It's Absolutely. That bi the biblical equality. And that right. is also for, for my own work in the world, that's been critical to, yeah. to us being able to move uh, forward in our, in the movement within my own denomination as well. So it's beautiful. So then you got involved with CBE, you got your Master of Divinity, and then there's also doctorate because you're yes. Dr. Angela. So just yes. can you just yes. tell us a little snippet about your doctoral work? Yes, my doctoral work actually continues along the same line because of my experiences coming into ministry, not really having seen a lot of female leaders, it's particularly not, what do you call it, legitimized leaders. I saw women working as leaders <laughs> in what they were functionally, but as far as being ordained, I had not seen that. And for me, when I began to do my doctorate work, that was a lot of the focus. How do we develop women as leaders to serve in the church? What do they need? What do they need that's the same as men? What do they need that's different than men? Because one of the things that is very true for women is the way that we are socialized growing up sometimes makes it difficult for us to move into those leadership roles. Whether even we've seen it in the corporate world, but what does it look like in our ecclesial settings? That was the focus of my doctorate work and it was called Streams in the Wasteland. It was a, a leadership development program, a six month program that looked at developing women as leaders, focusing on helping them understand their strengths and talents and gifts, understanding the mission of God in the world and how we listen to find out our place in bringing about that, bringing about the kingdom of God now in the world and also linking women to mentors, which is a very important piece as well, because oftentimes, at least I know as I was going through and me and other women that were in working on our MDiv and DMIN, we would talk about how either at our places of worship or even in, in the school, sometimes you might feel like you're just by yourself or there are just a few of you or whatever. And so beginning to understand, no, Elijah, you're not the only one. There's many, and there's women who've come before who are breaking the ground so that you can move into these places. And so really linking women together to support each other in their growth. It's so beautiful that solidarity is so important. Yeah. And I'm so grateful for, for you being a trailblazer in your own right, <laughs> even as perhaps you walk in, we both walk in, in the paths that have carved by the women that have gone before, but we've never needed it more than we do right now. 
yes. is uh, within the church. Uh, yes. And it's, I always say it's an antidote to what's happening out in the public square, yes. that the world's ways of women empowerment, we've got our way that's based in scripture and, you know, walking as Jesus calls us to walk. So it's, it's just beautiful to hear what you're doing. And so then what drew you to start a podcast to host a podcast and specifically on this topic of intersectionality. <laughs> so in full transparency, I had never thought of a podcast, honestly. It's so funny. Even when I consider my call, I, the question I always ask God is who is going to listen to me, right? <laughs> what do I have to say to somebody who wants to listen? But actually Mimi Haddad approached me about being part, she, that they were expanding the team for Mutuality Matters. And she had this vision for these various threads that would go into our topic line. And she asked me just what, what would be of interest to you? And this idea of intersectionality is one that interests me in ways, honestly, I think it it is when I talk, when we talk about lived experiences in the opening of our, of the segment, it really speaks to my lived experience, understanding what it means to be female, what it means to be African-American. What is, what do those things mean in a religious setting? How is that different than in a corporate environment or is it different or what are the things that are common and those things that are disparate? But so for me, it was really understanding, taking a look at how I've come to know God, how I've come to understand what it is to live in the kingdom. What does that mean? And how does it get expressed in my life based on these particular lenses or particular focuses of my identity that I bring to the table? So it was just a really natural place because I think intersectionality for an African-American woman in the United States is something that you deal with every day before you even know the term intersectionality. You're learning what it means to navigate in a world uh, where you're not majority, where you're, you are definitely minority and how you show up in a space and how you will have to comport yourself in that space. And it's just a very natural uh, topic for me, but it's one that when we talk about when God chooses you and plants you in a space, <laughs> you begin to understand that all of these things that create who you are, all these identities and experiences that combine and come together to manifest in your personhood, all of these God has purpose for, and he uses them. And they're telling something, they're giving some insight for us to understand our world and how he wants to trans, how God chooses to transform the world for his glory and for our benefit as well. That's amazing. And so your sort of discovery of intersectionality and it becoming something, I mean, there's something there that's so beautiful about like your lived experience, your understanding of an, an intersectionality. It's coming at a time um, in our world where I think more and more we're starting to understand that. And we knew, right? Those mm -hmm. of us who have done the study that know the history, right? Feminism and womanism, for example, those of us that are in ethnic and racial groups that we deal with stereotypes, right? Being too loud, too bossy, too angry, et cetera, et cetera. There's all right. these stereotypes <laughs> that we have to deal with. So there's things that you already are aware of, but being able to then weave that into the, uh, our experience in the ecclesia, as you were saying, it really is. It just feels like it's for such a time as this, Dr. Angela, that your work is so important. And this topic of intersectionality for us to be able to have these spaces where we can wrestle with that and we can bring that to light and have insights. Um, what I'm curious about is why is it so important? Why do you think? I'd love mm -hmm. to hear from you uh, in your seat of wisdom. Why is it so important for people of faith to understand and embrace intersectionality today in this season in the world? For me personally, growing up, I found myself oftentimes in school being the only black student in a class. Then I, and I've also lived in spaces where my, maybe my school experience, I'm the only one, but then my social life where I live, where I go to church, that's 
fully African-American experience. And so learning and seeing the differences in these worlds and what that means. Mm -hmm. So from a very young age, I've always had a desire to see racial reconciliation. Always. It just seemed to me that we should be able to get along. And even as this opportunity came forward, it came forward at a time right after the summer with George Floyd. I, and I always refer to that as the hot summer because that was a tinderbox, I think, and b between the George Floyd incident and then what was going on with COVID, highlighting disparities, racial disparities, even in the delivery of health care and access to care. And my understanding of God, that God is a God of the oppressed. God is a God of justice. And so as I began to think through those things, when I say the, all the mixing together comes together for such a time as this, then it's so as you are standing here in this space, then you have to understand how all of these things are affecting our world. Uh, keeping people from being able to come together as and being reconciled and living in love and forgiveness and grace and mercy, understanding how these things have played out becomes very heightened for me. And that's why when I think about intersectionality, it is incredibly important for us as believers to understand Maybe my experience is not your experience, but it doesn't mean that my experience is less important or your experience is less important than mine, that I can learn, we can learn from each other. And when we take the time to learn from each other, we, again, our ability to love our ability to be connected, our ability to grow as family, grow as individuals and manifest that grace and love that God shows us, that begins to uh, grow as well. So for me, that is why intersectionality, understanding these things, I think, it, especially in this country, and I'm sure it's the worldwide, because it seems humans, for whatever reason, we always have a way from which we can, we want to create groups and segment ourselves and place one group higher than another group. But that is not God's way. That's not God's way. And so the more that we can begin to understand the experiences embrace the good, bad, or indifferent, embrace them, learn from them and move forward from them. And that's what I believe when I begin to think about intersectionality, because we can talk about intersectionality from a myriad of different viewpoints and perspectives. Mm -hmm. But for me, when I, when I think about those that so much shape me as a preacher and professor, it is race, gender, and religion. These are like very much so part of the definition of who I am personally. CBE International presents Women in Scripture and Mission. Finding hope in the God who saved the Israelites from slavery, Rahab bravely protected the Israelite spies from Jericho's king. She prophesied to the spies of Israel's upcoming success and negotiated with them to save her entire clan. God honored Rahab's bravery and loyalty, making her a descendant of King David and Jesus. Learn more at ministrywomen.org. That's ministrywomen.org. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, it, it's so great that you're, again, this naming and claiming of intersectionality as part of the work of the ecclesia, part of the mm -hmm. work of reconciliation yeah. within the body of Christ. Yeah. Because of course we know, we thank Dr. Crenshaw for coining it in the law field so many decades ago and the ways that intersectionality is now used in DEIJ work and out in different organizational spaces. But I think within the church, we have to understand it as part of, this is part of God's God's reconciling work for us. Absolutely. Uh, and that's what I'm hearing you elevate. Absolutely helping people to understand the imperative there. So thank you for that. So then just thinking about the podcast and all the wonderful people that you've had the opportunity to interview over these last seasons, I was wondering if you would, if you were able to, I know it might be difficult, but just maybe to pull out two or three anecdotes of different guests and different things that you might've learned or different moments that surprised you when you were holding your interviews, anything that was especially 
enlightening that you might share as you were in your hosting seat? Yeah, I have to say we've had the opportunity to have so many wonderful guests with us. And one that I remember distinct, and I think it's because also reading the literature, I feel like I'm sliding when I lift one over the other because they were all so I knew unique. it would be hard for you. I yes. Knew <laughs> and they brought these little, these little drops here and there that just made me go, oh, but one of those had to do with Dr. Yolanda Pierce. And she's written the book, I think it's called My Grandmother's Kitchen. But I remember the story she was telling in the book about the church ladies, the church mothers, and how the church mo mothers guarded the young ladies and teaching them to be modest in their dress. And it was interesting because it was out of love, although it could have sounded very scolding and restrictive, but, but it was an understanding that they were trying to translate to the young ladies to keep you safe from predatory people who may be around you. And it was interesting to me, this idea of the family that you have in your church as your family and your family protecting you. And I don't know why that was one that hit me was because oftentimes we'll just say, oh, they're just old mean ladies that just want to tell you what to do. But in reality, it was really, again, this desire to keep you safe and to keep you protected as a young woman so that you didn't experience harm. And I, I thought, wow, that was really insightful with that. Another had to do with Dr. Uh, Foe, who brought the idea of intersectionality when we began to talk about Wall Street and the God of the multitude, that we serve the God of the multitude, and that we need to consider how even our financial practices should reflect the love of God. And how, what are we doing to maintain that? And the fact that can look America, very different than our current commerce that we experience in our country. Those were two that stood out to me. And then, of course, my very first guest, Dr. Renita Weems, uh, she's just one that I uh, love. She and Dr. Teresa Fry Brown, they are both women that I love that just bring you such wisdom about being embracing and the importance of bringing everyone to the table, their voices, letting their voices be heard. Another young person, Dr. Robinson, talked about ableism and yes. how we see those who may have certain disabilities and what does that mean? Just raising, raising these ideas about how we view people how we interact with those people because of our thoughts. We, we may not even be conscious of that because someone is in a wheelchair, because someone may have suffered a stroke or whatever, then we begin to somehow put them, push them to the margins. We don't even realize it. We may be doing it with the sweetest intentions, but we begin to minimize their input, minimize their value to the process as we're whatever it is, whatever decision-making process, oh, you just stay right there. And so all of these pieces to the puzzle, I, I just found the word just so interesting in saying, this is, these are the spaces where we can live more fully into God's vision for us. Yeah, that's so beautiful. No, that I wasn't so one. <laughs> Uh, listen, two, three, however many you wanted to bring up just to just little nuggets, because each one it's cl clearly each one of your guests had amazing things to share. So mm -hmm. when I was shaping the way I would invite the question, it was about like an anecdote, a moment as yeah. opposed to the person themselves, right? Because yeah, they're all yeah. stellar contributors to the body, to all of these things that we're processing and talking about and that are so important to this work of reconciliation and living rightly together. And I, I, one thing I just wanted to say in the spaces that I travel in, where we're talking all the time about dismantling systems of mm -hmm. oppression, such as racism, sexism, and ableism is also very important. That's yeah. the forgotten one many times. 
So I appreciate that you lifted that up because I think we've got to keep that always in front of us. Mm -hmm. It's the one that can get, in terms of intersectionality, it can get left out mm -hmm. uh, very, I mean, very and, easily. And, and another piece that's not, is classism. Mm -hmm. That That's another piece that we don't talk about in this country a lot, but it's very much and has an impact in our world on, again, how people see you, how people interact with you and the ways that privilege is expressed and utilized. And I think that there, when we look in the scriptures, there are scriptures that talk about if you have privilege, that's okay. But with that privilege comes a responsibility toward taking care and uplifting, speaking up. In Proverbs 31, it's a conversation to the king and to the ruler. You're in power. So it is up to you to make sure that you are a voice for the voiceless. It is up to you to make sure that you are uh, working on behalf of the destitute. And so again, the expression of kingdom now, we have to be mindful of all of those things. Yes, you may have achieved your station in life or whatever, but it doesn't mean that you achieve that only for yourself. You achieve, in other words, you, you're achieving that to be a blessing to someone else. You're blessed to be a blessing. That's what we always say at our church. Yeah, you're absolutely. blessed to be a blessing. And it's just very important for us to always remember that and what that looks like. Doing that with humility, doing that with grace that maintains and honors the humanity of all of those that we are hoping to lift up. Wonderful. So I'm wondering then, as we're closing out our time together, if there's just like one most important thing that if people want to get started, people of faith wanting to get started, wanting to do something, what can they do to honor intersectionality and create healthy spaces of inclusion and equity in their contexts? What is like one thing that they could take with them? Like For me, it begins with listening and learning, listening and learning, listen and learn from each other. Learn, don't assume that you understand a person's life. Don't assume that you understand the impact of the things that are going on. And don't assume when someone tells you them that what they're saying cannot be true. Mm -hmm. you, you understand what I'm saying? During the George Floyd piece, I remember talking to some friends who were white and I was explaining how we talk about in African-Americans, as you're raising your children, your boys, your girls, both really, you have a talk with them about how you interact with the police. And I was sharing my own experience, me, a Rice student, walking with a friend at night and then being stopped by the cops because it was like, what are you doing in this neighborhood? And it was simply because of the color of our skin. We weren't doing anything but walking, simply walking down the street and very much so in this neighborhood where they lived. And I just was... And they're like, oh, that's a one-time. No, it's not a one-time thing. We all have the stories. We all have, and some of us have some very traumatic stories of interactions with officers. So this is a reality. And so when I tell you it's a reality, then the responsibility is to listen and honestly begin to accept, wow, that's not my reality, but that's your reality. And because of that, then yes, maybe that's something that we can work on together. And maybe I can use my influence or whatever to change that situation. So it's not your reality anymore. And that's, and that is, and I give that experience, but there are multiple places and spaces. We could be talking about healthcare. We could be talking about any educational disparities. We could be talking about any of those spaces, but understanding that it requires us listening to each other, to understand each other's stories, to understand the experience, and then having that compassion for others so that all of us can live into when God says, I have plans for you, for a hope in your future. How can I be a part of bringing about God's plans 
and this beautiful future that he has for all of us and really embracing that idea that I want to be a part that kingdom living and bringing about God's kingdom extends not only to the forgiveness of our sins, but it also extends into how we live our lives and interact with each other in every aspect of our lives. The kingdom of God is all of that. Mm -hmm. It's all of that. It's not just this little section related to our spirituality, but it's part of all of those things that we experience in life. And so that's for me what I'm, I hope most as we have conversations about what we see with, with respect to oppression and understanding what oppression looks like and how it appears in this country and across the world. What does oppression look like? But then also as believers, our role in bringing that, you know, bring, breaking that down. So for me, When I think through a listener, for me, my first thing is to say, learning to listen openly and and accepting what you're hearing as you're listening and understanding someone else's lived experience and understanding there's an opportunity that for me to learn from what I'm hearing. Yes. That is, it, 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 thank you. I'm so inspired myself because I've seen what happens when people do exactly what you're saying. So I just want to encourage our listeners. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Angela is speaking <laughs> the truth. So inspire, <laughs> inspire my beloveds. Because if people can, in the work of unconscious bias, when you're trying mm-hmm. to undo your unconscious bias, implicit bias is the other term for it. Perspective taking is, yes. is one of the things. Just yes. understand what somebody else's experience is, is so critical. And then also what I was hearing In what you're saying is, because you mentioned compassion, humility, you have to check your own issues at the door. You have to clear yourself from being triggered into a defensive posture. And that's what I love about what you're inviting people into this posture of listening and learning, because you don't have to defend yourself. You don't have to try to come up with some answer. Right. You're, You're just there to have that open posture of humility and perspective taking, uh, And I can guarantee that there's several, if not many people that are listening right now that are going to be able to take this with them and start to see, just try it on friends, just try it on and see what happens. Because Um, I think the Holy Ghost works, mm -hmm. takes it and works. And Mm will, when you allow yourself to be, for me, I say, placing yourself on the altar, right? And you are, you're allowing God to speak to you in those ways and open your mind in those ways, then God can use you in ways you're not expecting to make a difference and and to bring about change. And that's what it is for me, honestly. So beautiful. So powerful. (laughs) So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Angela, for this amazing conversation. Oh my goodness. So many (laughs) things that we learned today and that I learned. And I just want to finish up by saying, you were saying at, at the beginning, it was a little daunting to be sharing from yourself, uh, to be in the interviewee's seat. And I just want to name for you that I, I've been able to listen to a few of the podcasts. And that one, you mentioned her already, but Dr. Teresa uh, Fry Brown, your interview with her, it blessed my soul and it blessed my doctoral work because oh. I am in my own doctoral studies right now in transformational preaching. Oh, and let yeah. me tell you, your conversation yeah. and everything she said, I was taking notes. I have to go back and listen again. I'm probably yeah. going to be quoting and citing that particular podcast. And I have already ordered her book, Delivering the Sermon. So I just want to name for you, I am living, uh, I'm a living testimony to the blessing of your hosting and of you being in conversation with all of these amazing people. And I'm, I'm particularly grateful for the conversation with Dr. Fred Brown. I appreciate that. Yeah, she is, again, like I said, she is one of those, I, I have about four women that just, for me, they're, they are up there. <laughs> and she is that I am, what do you call it? Right fangirling. Yes, that's it. Fangirling. So absolutely. That's wonderful. 
All right, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. <laughs> so good to be together. Yes. Yeah, so please stay tuned. We're going to have more new episodes each week and we are excited to bring you guys up. But in the meantime, I want to just encourage you as always to follow CBE International on Facebook and Twitter. And you should also go to our website at www.cbeinternational.org. There's tons of, co of content there. And you can even subscribe. There's a blog, there's a magazine, and we even have an academic journal that's heavily research-based. So for those of you who are those deep thinkers, you'll enjoy that. But also there are videos and uh, other audios of past conferences that you can check out as well. Also, we invite you to visit the bookstore. Where again, as you Liz has mentioned, and and I know that I have definitely gotten a ton of resources when I was doing my studies and even just in reading and understanding the Bible and understanding women in the Bible. Tons of resources there that you can find by very talented authors on the subjects that will enrich your faith and equip you to use your own God-given talents in leadership and service to the gospel, regardless of your gender, ethnicity, or class. I am Dr. Angela Raven Anderson, and this is soon to be Dr. Liz Testa. <laughs> <laughs> we are Mutuality Matters, and thank you for listening. Until next time, bye bye. Bye bye. bye. Mutuality Matters podcast, along with thousands of CBE's other resources and content, is available for free on CBE's website, which is possible because of donor support. Together, we can spread the message that God calls women and men of all cultures, races, and classes to share authority equally in service and leadership in the home, church, and world. Give today at cbe.today slash donate.